favorite topic of mine, coevolution and mutualism. The earliest described mutualisms were trophic mutualisms, where two species or live together, helping each other survive where neither could alone, like lichens and mycorrhizal fungi. But mutualisms can also be defensive, such as those that involve ants visiting plants with extra floral nectaries and protecting them against herbivores, or the clownfish living inside the sea anemones, which protect them from predators. There are cleaner mutualisms, like that between the hippo and the ox pecker that picks ectoparasites such as ticks off the hippo's body, and the moray eel with its cleaner prawn. The moray eels eat everything, but they don't eat these prawns, which help keep them tidy. There are lots of different dispersive mutualisms. Pollination is one where visitors to flowers carry pollen and the gametes of plants to their mates. This is a picture of the roughly velvet seed with the hawk moth visiting its flowers. And this hawk moth was probably Paragonia lusca, whose caterpillars eat the leaves of the plant too. Maybe you can see on this leaf here along the midrib, there's a caterpillar and it has a little a tail here that is typical of a hawk moth caterpillar. Another dispersive mutualism is animals that eat fruits of flowering plants or gymnosperms and disperse the seeds. Here's a toucan which would um, disperse great distances the seeds of this tropical nutmeg tree. The nutmeg spice would be from the seed, the arrow, the part the toucan likes to eat, that's the part that could make the spice we know as mace. So coevolution can be defined as reciprocal evolutionary change. It demands and produces some degree of specialization in the interactions between species but not all highly specialized interactions are co-evolved. John Thompson is a scientist who's done a lot of work in the theory and gathering real data about coevolution. He suggested the term the coevolutionary mosaic to describe the way that populations interact with different species throughout their range and become differentiated in degrees of specialization evolving along different trajectories in different places. The term coevolution was first used in the 1960s by Larry Gilbert and Peter Raven in a classic paper where they talked about lupins and lysenids as one example of butter butterfly host plant interaction and then another big paper in which they looked at specialization in many different groups of insects and plants. But their definition first portrayed coevolution as one species to one species. Since that time, though, there have been many different uses of the term. Sometimes it's meant one species to many species, for example, hummingbirds to their plants, many species to many species. And these two later uses of the term have been called by some scientists diffuse coevolution. So, an example of one to one coevolution is the obligate mutualism between yucca, this is different from yucca, by the way, which is manioc, but this is truly yucca in the agavesi, and the yucca moth, tegeticula. This little moth is one of the few pollinators that deliberately pollinates a plant. The mother will 
go to the stamen of the flower, these little yellow spots on top are the anthers, collect pollen, and then come and shove the pollen into the stigmatic surface. And then she'll lay her eggs into the ovules inside the ovary. So she's ensuring pollination to allow the ovules to grow for her larvae to feed upon. Fortunately for the plant, some of the ovules mature into seeds, but this obligate mutualism has arisen as a result of this sort of parasitic herbivorous relationship, but that came to benefit the plant. So John Thompson, that co-evolution guy I mentioned before, has looked at a number of related moth-plant relationships and found that these parasitic relationships often do precede obligate mutualisms. One such um, obligate mutualism in process is that of the Greya moths and their host plants, Lithophragma. So one of the kinds of diffuse coevolution is one to many, and here are some examples of that, a certain plant species <coughs> and all of the herbivores that eat it, maybe one animal species and all of its different parasites, fleas, ticks, worms, etc., or maybe one ectomycorrhizal fungus species and all of the plants, the trees with which it associates. And then for many to many, this is where we might see hummingbirds in an area and hummingbird plants. I guess if we thought of hummingbirds in South Florida, where we usually only have the ruby-throated, maybe this would be one to many. Um, ants and plants with ant-dispersed seeds, so different species of ants that might take those seeds and the plants that have those seeds. Birds that eat fre fleshy fruited plants carnivores and their animal prey. So you see that this can be pretty diffuse and loose and maybe hard to imagine how coevolution might take place. So some people assume that coevolution happens only in mutualisms or that it's more common in mutualisms. It's not necessarily so. There are many antagonistic relationships that can also be coevolved those of competitors, of predator and prey, herbivores and host plants, nectar robbers and nectar plants. So I want to tell you about an interesting phenomenon that happens in a number of systems, that of floral mimicry, where animals are fooled to visiting flowers with no reward because those flowers look like flowers that do have a reward. And that's how pollination works. Normally animals visit flowers to get a reward, nectar, oil, or pollen. But certain species of plants economize by not making the reward, but mimicking species that do. An example of this right in our neighborhood is oil-collecting bees and the flowers of the Malpighiaceae family. These bees are widespread throughout the tropics, and we have some species native here in South Florida, too. Our native Malpighiaceae in the upper left-hand corner is the locust berry bush, Bursonema lucida, which is pollinated, visited by oil-collecting bees. I'm going to try to show you a, the bee in this picture, kind of small. Two species of oil collecting bees, Centris aerans on the left from the side and the dorsal surface, and Centris lanosa on the right. These guys collect oil and rub it into the little pads on their legs. There are several other Malpighiaceae cultivated here in South Florida. Stigmaphilon in the lower left and in the lower right, Malpighia coccidera. All of these flowers have oil pads. I'll show you here on the Bursanema underneath the flower, and the bees reach through 
the openings in the petals to grab these oil glands and their bellies rub the pollen in the center of the flower. But there's another group of plants, Oncidium species in the upper right hand corner, the orchids, that offer no reward but are visited by these bees. If you catch these bees, they have pollen from all the different Malpighiaceae, the locust berry, Bersinima lucida, Stigma philon, lower left, Malpighia coccidera, upper right, and even Thryalis glauca. I didn't show you a picture of that. All of these have similar pollen but of different sizes, so you can distinguish it. So in this system, the bees collect oil from the flowers. The Malpighiaceae species, Malpigs we can call them, all have oil in their flowers. The orchids, Oncidium orchids, do not have oil. So what kind of mimicry is this? I want you to think about the two kinds of mimicry we learned about before. Batesian mimicry and Mullerian mimicry. Which kind is this and how does it work? I want you to expand your mind to realize that mimicry doesn't only involve predator-prey situations. So mutualisms were described a long time ago, but not much was made of them. They were, as I mentioned, the trophic mutualisms were the first ones described. Mycorrhizae and also nitrogen fixing nodules on legume plants. W.C. Ali was a Quaker zoologist who proposed theories of cooperation, and he liked to apply ecological ideas to problems in human society too. But mutualism didn't become a major element in ecology or emerging population ecology until later in the 20th century. I'd say it was about in the 1970s when the environmental movement started. Earth Day happened first, I think, in 1972. In the 1970s, more people started studying ecology in graduate school, and there were challenges in their training, which had been before this time, individual fitness above all, and that competition was the most important interaction structuring nature. The phrase nature red in tooth and claw gave way to nature green in root and flower. So nowadays, both are recognized as very important organizing principles of nature.